Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Treatment of Myocarditis webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we'll conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You may also use the chat feature located on the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press the star followed by the 0. As a reminder, the conference is being recorded Friday, February 18th, 2011. I would now like to turn the conference over to Dr. Leslie Cooper. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Oh. Oh, you go. Oh, sorry. Hi, everyone, and welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just a reminder that your lines are muted, just like you just heard, and we'll do the questions and answers at the end. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Leslie Cooper. He's here today with us. Um, he's a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic, and he's the president of the Myocarditis Foundation. Here he is. Uh, thank you, uh, Brianna and uh, James. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, attending this webinar. I, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'd like to review uh, the treatment of myocarditis, uh, as, which is generally directed by the uh, acute presentations. Um, I'll say up front, uh, my slides had some animation, but and they may look a little bit out of uh, sync because the animation won't work in this uh, format, but I will walk you through them, uh, and the information in the slides should be apparent anyway. I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, and that will leave us about 30 minutes for questions and answers. Um, to begin, um, by way of background, um, I've been uh, at Mayo for 15 years and studying myocarditis for about 18 years. And my particular interest is a rare form of myocarditis called giant cell myocarditis, which is uh, particularly dangerous. Most myocarditis is not nearly so severe and the treatment uh, generally follows the guidelines which have been established for the management of heart failure or arrhythmias uh, in the context of other conditions. But uh, there are four clinical presentations uh, which I, you should be aware of as we begin our discussion. Um, many people who develop inflammation in the heart either as a consequence of a viral illness or sometimes a toxic injury such as a vaccination or a drug exposure um, are asymptomatic. Uh, there is evidence of inflammation either by uh, biomarkers in the serum or blood which are elevated and indicate cardiac damage, or changes on an electrocardiogram, or sometimes even imaging uh, changes on something like an echocardiogram or a cardiac MRI. But those asymptomatic patients tend to do very well. Their heart function is usually normal, and they usually recover the acute injury without any consequences. Because there's very little data on the treatment of uh, people with asymptomatic myocarditis, I'm not going to mention that uh, beyond this point in the talk. The rest of the talk will focus on people who have symptoms, and primarily those people who have heart failure or presentation with chest pain. Um, it's important to recognize that uh, a small minority of patients who do have myocarditis present with sudden death, um, and uh, we only know of those people because of autopsy studies. And there have been eight or nine uh, large autopsy studies published which looked at the uh, frequency of myocarditis, and it turns out that myocarditis is an important cause of sudden death and morbidity and mortality in young people. But because it... Uh, uh, the, this talk is on management and treatment. We're going to focus on the heart failure and chest pain syndromes. So uh, most myocarditis is caused by uh, viruses in North America and Europe. Uh, the causes of myocarditis in the rest of the world are not well known because with that, through most of South America, most of Africa, and much of Asia, we simply don't know, uh, we don't have the testing available to say what viruses or other pathogens are responsible for myocarditis. Uh, this slide shows at the top left Gilbert Daldorf, who was, is a physician, he was a physician in New York, and he worked for the New York Public Health Department in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. And his major contribution to myocarditis was that in the summer of 1947, he went with a colleague, Gray Sickles, to Coxsackie, New York, uh, the middle panel shows the sign, the exit sign for Coxsackie in New York. And there he and his colleague isolated from stool samples from two children with pol a polio-like illness uh, 
the Coxsackie viruses, Coxsackie A and Coxsackie B, illustrated in the bottom right panel. And those, um, uh, and those viruses are res uh, historically responsible for a very large percent of myocarditis uh, cases. It turns out that in the last decade, um, uh, these viruses have become less important and other viruses more important. But nonetheless, all of our model systems, our animal model systems to, by which we understand the pathogenesis and the cause of myocarditis, the mechanisms of myocarditis come from uh, models in which these viruses are used, uh, really. So I wanted to give you that by way of historical background, that viruses are the most common cause. But interestingly, in acute myocarditis, the virus damage is usually done within a, uh, within a day or two of the onset of symptoms. And so there's very little opportunity to treat myocarditis, even if it's caused by a virus, with antiviral drugs. And that's uh, important to recognize. There are few patients who develop chronic viral infections. They may respond to antiviral therapy, but those are uncommon. That the vast majority of people with acute myocarditis do not require antiviral therapy or uh, uh, suppression of the immune system, which is causing the inflammation. In the next slide, um, we skipped one. You can see um, myocarditis uh, is the third leading cause of sudden death in people under age 40. Um, of those studies I referenced, this is a representative one uh, published from the Australian literature where almost 3,000 autopsies were performed in young patients of whom 193 died of sudden cardiac death and of those 12 percent or 23 patients were due to myocarditis. And that, as I said, is about an average. Uh, in the published studies, it's between 5 and 20 percent in people under the age of 40 and after anomalous coronary arteries and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it is the third leading cardiac cause of sudden death. Now, um, today, uh, if we, if, uh, that's the last we're going to speak about sudden death and myocarditis. Today, uh, if you focus on people who have heart failure and uh, dilated or large hearts that poorly function, you can, uh, this uh, survival curve uh, illustrates the uh, rate of death per year in a group of 373 patients who presented with acute cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy possibly related to myocarditis. Not all of them had the diagnosis of myocarditis. Many, the vast majority, in fact, were not, uh, did not have a heart biopsy. But you can see that there was only a 4.5% uh, chance of death or transplant in the first year and only a 2% uh, chance in years two and three. Overall, that's about a 10% rate of death or transplant over three years, and about half of those patients, or 5% over three years, had a transplant, so only 5% died. That is a much better survival overall than uh, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And it's important uh, to recognize that because myocarditis is uncommon. And if you uh, try to uh, have a treatment, it would prevent uh, people from dying of myocarditis who have acute disease. You would need to realize that those patients who did not receive the treatment, those in the control group getting optimal medical care, would only have a 5% likelihood of dying at three years. That's a good number, but it means that it's impossible to test new treatment strategies in the acute setting. Now, in contrast to that, as we'll discuss momentarily, it is possible uh, in patients who have chronic myocarditis to perform clinical trials and, and evaluate the effectiveness of new therapies. What are the predictors of death or heart transplantation in myocarditis? Uh, and the reason I focus on this next is because these are the people who uh, are at highest risk and who might benefit uh, greatest from specific therapies. Those people uh, at highest risk of death or transplant are those who have the greatest heart damage, and that is reflected in a decrease in the ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood pumped each, uh, with each heartbeat uh, by the left ventricle or the heart. And uh, that pump function in damaged hearts occurs at very high filling pressures. 
And so higher pressures, lower ejection fraction, larger heart size are all uh, positively correlated with um, de increased risk of death or transplant. In, on heart biopsy, there are certain histologic features which are also associated with death or transplant, and those are giant cell myocarditis, uh, cardiac sarcoidosis, and hypersensitivity myocarditis, which looks very different than the usual post-viral myocarditis. And lastly, there are certain changes on the electrocardiogram, uh, particularly Q waves and a particularly wide QRS, and I won't explain what those are at this point, but we can answer them during the questions and uh, in 20 minutes or so. And these are the easily available um, uh, predictors of death or transplant uh, and the patients in whom you might want to consider tailored therapy. For the vast majority of people who have heart failure, they do very well with standard guideline-based therapy. Uh, this slide shows the uh, papers from 2005 and 6 and most recently 2009 uh, from the organizations in Europe and the United States that write guidelines about heart failure. And uh, these are uh, long documents that, that have lots of details, but the bottom line is that what is good for people with other causes of cardiomyopathy, either from blocked arteries or valvular heart disease or um, congenital heart disease, is also generally good for patients with myocarditis. So uh, the first message is follow the guidelines. And I'll go over a few examples of that in just a moment. Um, standard heart failure therapy, um, I should say, is designed uh, to improve survival, first of all, and then improve quality of life. And quality of life is often measured as fewer hospitalizations. And the challenge is that the therapies that have been proven to be effective in these disorders are not universally applied for a variety of reasons. The medicines that are first-line therapy in acute myocarditis with heart failure are an ACE inhibitor, here abbreviated ACEI, that's angiotensin, converting enzyme inhibitors such as lisinopril um, or a beta blocker such as carvedilol or metoprolol. Uh, those would be titrated up to target doses over the first three months of therapy in all people who present with myocarditis and acute heart failure. Um, in addition, there are other medicines that are useful in patients who have persistent symptoms after the first two drugs have been uh, uh, increased to optimal doses, and those would include spironolactone and a plerinone, two aldosterone antagonists. There are other medicines as well, uh, which I haven't listed. Um, if you look at the effect of medical therapy on mortality over the last 30 years in people with uh, heart failure, and this is not just patients with myocarditis, but all patients, these data also apply to heart to myocarditis patients. The um, likelihood of dying in the first year was about 16% in the 1980s. And that dropped to around 12% after the uh, uh, first ACE inhibitors, such as enalapril and lisinopril, were used and captopril. Then in the late 1990s, when beta blockers were introduced, um, the likelihood of dying in the first year dropped from about 125 to about 8%, a very substantial reduction. And then in patients who had persistent heart failure uh, with um, a dilated cardiomyopathy like we see in myocarditis, uh, some of them are candidates for implantable defibrillators. And on the right, between the green and the blue uh, columns or bars there, you can see a drop from about 8 to a little bit under 6% annual mortality, uh, and that's as of about 2005. And uh, in the myocarditis patients, I think overall they do uh, a bit better. And you can see uh, from our the survival curve I showed a few minutes ago, we're looking at about a 2.5% likelihood of dying in the first year uh, overall. So um, these are the next uh, few slides uh, focus on standard therapies to give you an example of uh, what we would use 
in the management of, of myocarditis patients, in those patients who were intolerant of an ACE inhibitor because of a cough or uh, trouble with their kidneys, we use um, angiotensin receptor blockers. And one example would be candesartan. And this slide shows the effect of candesartan in patients with acute heart, with heart failure who were not able to take ACE inhibitors. And in these 2,028 patients, compared to uh, people in placebo, on the, um, there was a marked reduction in the risk of death on the left at about 75% cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization in the yellow bar in the middle at about 70%, and overall heart failure hospitalization at about 60% as compared to placebo. And these and, and many other data in myocarditis, which would apply also to myocarditis patients, suggest that uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers here, the candesartan, are indicated in the management of those patients. Uh, this slide is an older set of data from 1997 looking at an aldosterone inhibitor called uh, spironolactone. And uh, in this slide, you can see in the uh, orangish uh, peach colored bars um, the likelihood of dying on the left, uh, dying from a cardiac cause uh, next to that, um, heart failure uh, death uh, next, and sudden death all the way on the right. And with spironolactone in this study of about 1,600 people, there was a significant decrease, as illustrated in the yellow bars, uh, in all of those important endpoints, uh, including heart failure hospitalizations. People felt better as well. So then, um, uh, what about non-standard therapy? You can imagine that myocarditis uh, is a um, inflammatory state. Uh, that's how it's defined. And so treatments aimed at decreasing inflammation might be beneficial. Unfortunately, that is not the case in acute myocarditis. It may be the case in chronic myocarditis. But in the acute setting, uh, a number of clinical trials have looked at this question, the most famous of which is now 15 years old. This is uh, appropriately called the myocarditis treatment trial. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1995. And in this study, uh, the goal was to determine if immunosuppressive therapy would improve heart function. Here, LVEF stands for left ventricular ejection fraction. That's a standard measurement of heart function in patients with acute myocarditis. The average duration of symptoms was one month, although you could have up to two years of symptoms at enrollment. There was no coronary disease, and everyone's heart pump function was diminished. A normal ejection fraction is about 65%, and everybody in this study had to have an ejection fraction of under 45%. And the bottom line was that after 111 people were enrolled, which took about five years, it was a difficult study to uh, enroll for, they were treated with a combination of immunosuppressant drugs, which we can discuss later, or uh, placebo, uh, and what the study showed in the next slide is that there was a very similar increase in the ejection fraction, 7% uh, in conventional or placebo arm, and 10%, which was not significantly different in the immunosuppressant arm, at 28 weeks, which is their primary endpoint. And on the right side, you can see two survival curves out to five years on the x-axis. And at that time, before we used beta blockers, um, there was about a 7% um, annual likelihood of death or transplant, and the, um, there was no difference between immunosuppression and uh, the control arms. So the uh, bottom line of this trial is that immunosuppression did not improve heart function or survival. Other studies have shown similar results, but th that's the most important one to show. Uh, this study which was published six years later, uh, is still the best in the field for intravenous immunoglobulin. This is a, uh, a, a, an agent which affects both viral, antiviral, it's an antiviral agent as well as an immunosuppressant in some ways. And of the 62 people enrolled in this study, they were randomized to either the intravenous immunoglobulin or the placebo therapy. And that they're, uh, and in this group, 
uh, you can see there was no significant difference in the improvement between the placebo arm and the intravenous immunoglobulin arm on the right. Um, the ejection fraction on the heart increased 14% at six months in both groups, and about 15 to 16% in both groups at 12 months. And that percent increase, interestingly, uh, 10 years ago now, uh, has not changed. We still see today about a 15 to 16% improvement in ejection fraction following acute myocarditis. About a third of people normalize, a third get better but don't completely normalize, and about a third have no significant improvement following standard guideline-based therapy. Although their symptoms may improve, their heart pump function doesn't. So what is the bottom line of this? That in addition to standard therapy for acute myocarditis, we do not use any immunosuppressant drugs except for rare cases such as giant cell myocarditis. Um, this uh, data, uh, these data are from um, the current uh, IMAC2 study. I showed you the survival curve, which was the 5% one year and about 10% three year rate of death or transplant for all people with acute dilated cardiomyopathy. This is from the same study, and what it shows is that um, the larger your heart, in the white bars, had these, the white bars on the right are the largest hearts, greater than 70 millimeter size of the left ventricle. They had less improvement, at low, uh, going from 20 to 32 percent, or a 13 percent difference, compared to those with the smallest hearts, less than six millimeters, that had a 19 percent increase. You can see the change bars on the right. Larger hearts have worse recovery, and it may be that in people who have the, the least recovery, there's an opportunity to do uh, new clinical trials. So the last slide here on therapy, standard therapy, is about um, sudden death and preventing sudden death. In patients with acute myocarditis, there's about um, all comers, maybe a 1% likelihood of sudden death in the first year, maybe 2% depending on what how sick the population is. But it, in those people at highest risk, uh, an implantable defibrillator can improve survival and de by decreasing the rate of sudden death. This study, uh, which came out um, in 2009, shows that in the green lines, people are the people's survival if they received an implantable defibrillator as compared to those who did not receive an implantable defibrillator in the peach colored or red lines and survival, or uh, here um, lower is better. Um, these curves are inverted uh, the way it's presented. The um, event rate, which would be death, cardiac death on the left or sudden death on the right, were improved with a defibrillator. So the bottom line is it should, uh, people who have a, a persistent cardiomyopathy following myocarditis uh, should have a defibrillator um, if they're in the highest risk category. And some people don't recover. This slide is a, a chest x-ray of a young woman who received a uh, implantable um, ventricular assist device. You can see there's a pacemaker on the left side of her chest, but more importantly, there's that white structure at the tip of her heart, which is a uh, Jarvik 2000 uh, ventricular assist device. She actually did very well and uh, improved, and ultimately that was removed. But uh, it's important to recognize that some people do require a heart transplant, some people do require these devices, and um, many people who get the devices, given enough time, will actually recover and can have them explanted uh, without a heart transplant. So where are we going from here? That, that's everything I wanted to say about acute uh, uh, cardiomyopathy due to myocarditis. Um, in people who present primarily with chest pain um, without heart failure, they tend to do very well with anti-inflammatory, very mild anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen or ibuprofen-like drugs or a medicine called colchicine, which is also an anti-inflammatory. Uh, uh, with that, I'm going to change our focus to chronic cardiomyopathy. These are people who have more than six months of symptoms of heart failure, and, they, and even despite the best medical therapy, they still have symptoms.
so it's a small fraction of the people who originally get myocarditis acutely. This study uh, from the European Heart Journal in 2009 uh, looked at the effect of immunosuppression, the same kind of immunosuppression that we saw in the myocarditis treatment trial, but they were looking at patients with chronic cardiomyopathy in whom there was myocarditis, but no evidence of a viral infection. So you, you know already that viruses cause myocarditis and that a small percentage of people persistently have viruses in the heart, but the vast majority of people clear the viruses, and the vi those viruses are usually gone very quickly, um, and then the inflammation persists. That's, this group of people are those who had acute myocarditis, the viruses went away, but they had persistent inflammation. And out of 512 people they screened, they, they identified 85 who met their entry criteria. Again, a small percentage of the overall a number, maybe 17%. And in that group the, who were treated with immunosuppression, they had a 20% improvement in their heart pump function from 26 to 46% ejection fraction at six months, a very remarkable number. Uh, these similar data have been reported from another center in Poland, and I think that the take-home point from this is that timing is everything, that if you have acute inflammation, it's generally good for you. It's there for a reason to get rid of the viruses, and impairing that doesn't make you live any longer or feel any better. But in the chronic setting, if your immune system on its own has not done the job and you haven't uh, been a and it, there's still inflammation inappropriately, at that time point, then immunosuppression may be beneficial. At Mayo, uh, we're working on, um, let me go back one, um, immunoabsorption. This is uh, people uh, at Mayo who do uh, uh, apheresis procedures. This is where blood is taken out of one vein, uh, serum and, and the cells are separated, and then the serum is filtered and, and everything without the uh, stuff that's filtered off is returned to the patient. And this has actually been effective. There, there are trials in Japan and Germany, and we're starting a new trial here uh, looking at this technique uh, to manage people with chronic myocarditis. I'm going to move ahead here. Um, this is just a close-up view of the um, machine that uh, is a plasma pump that you use to filter plasma. And so where are we going? Um, at this point, um, people with myocarditis uh, should be treated with guideline-based therapy uh, as uh, for both arrhythmias and for heart failure. Um, beyond those standard medications in acute myocarditis, there is no role for immunosuppressive therapy. However, in chronic myocarditis, which is defined a little bit differently, then uh, there is uh, probably going to be a role for immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, that's, those data still need to be confirmed in a larger randomized trial. There are exceptions that are very important, and those include giant cell myocarditis, which is a rare autoimmune acute or fulminant disease, uh, which, does, uh, which is almost always fatal and which does respond to immunosuppressive therapy uh, rapidly. Um, but that only represents 1% of myocarditis. And then there are other disorders, hypersensitivity myocarditis, which is related to usually an adverse drug effect, or sometimes um, cardiac sarcoid, which is another kind of autoimmune disease. Uh, it's also very rare, and it usually does respond to immunosuppression. And then we're looking at new diagnostic tests because heart biopsy, which is currently the gold standard uh, for the diagnosis of myocarditis is invasive, expensive, and risky. And for those reasons, it's not widely available. And most of Africa, Asia, South America, Central America have no access to that technology. And so we're trying hard to find diagnostic tests that are simple and inexpensive that can be based on blood or, or echo images, which would allow uh, give us enough information to treat myocarditis. We're, uh, the next slide shows the um, heart failure network, which is supported by our tax dollars and which um, uh, is doing some work on in inflammation in the heart. Uh, 
And finally, I would say on behalf of the foundation that uh, we do give research grants uh, three or so every year and support young investigators in outstanding laboratories uh, to do uh, research and uh, advance the science and ultimately help people to live longer and feel better. So it's been just 30 minutes. Uh, with that overview, I'd be happy to open this to questions um, if uh, Brianna or James would lead. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You'll hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. Your line will briefly be accessed from the conference to obtain information. You may also use the chat feature located on the lower left corner of your screen. Thank you. Uh, with the ejection fracture improving to uh, sorry, ejection fracture improving to above 65 percent or thereabouts, um, my wife's got giant cell myocarditis. Is it proposed that future treatment would say that the immunosuppressants can be reduced? Good question. Um, what I'm going to do, um, let me just ask James, can everybody hear me on the line, or do I need to repeat the question? No, uh, everyone can hear you on the line. Great. So, so again, the question is uh, a very specific one with respect to giant cell myocarditis, which is the rare primarily autoimmune cardiomyopathy. Uh, if you have full recovery of heart function, can you ever discontinue immune suppressive therapy? And the uh, short answer is that the, no one knows the answer to that. There have been, uh, in the first year, uh, everyone with giant cell myocarditis uh, with a combination generally of cyclosporin with prednisone as if those are tolerated. There are other immunosuppressant drugs that can be used if those drugs are not tolerated. Beyond one year, uh, we know that there have been two cases of fulminant fatal recurrences, both between one and two years after abruptly discontinuing immunosuppressive therapy, and that the time between discontinuing immunosuppressive therapy and recurrence was five to six months. So the recurrence is not always is not immediate, um, and short interruptions in immunosuppressive therapy are probably safe. However, um, so we know you shouldn't completely discontinue immunosuppressive therapy before two years. What I do is I generally decrease it uh, to a very low level uh, of one uh, agent. Everybody's different, though, and uh, each some people may take much longer to lower the dose than two years. Um, what I do is I share with my patients whether what what information we have, and most people choose to stay on a low dose of a single agent if they're having no side effects. We, uh, that's an immunosuppressive agent, which to me is a reasonable choice. I don't be in the absence of, of not, uh, actual data. I have a couple of patients who, after seven or eight years, have chosen to discontinue immunosuppression completely, and they seem to be doing well with a short-term follow-up. Um, what you're getting at is really how long does it take your body to, re to forget that, you're, uh, that it should reject your heart as a foreign body? How, or the term, the more formal term is tolerance. How long does it take to get toler peripheral tolerance to your, to your heart tissues? And that's a tricky question because um, it may be that you could be tolerant of the heart for many years and then have a, a re-stimulation either due to... Um, incidental cardiac injury or a heart attack or uh, which uh, would trigger uh, the immune system again. So that's a long answer, but I think that it's fair to say that uh, everyone should be on some level of immune suppression for at least two years. Okay, because I've been uh, at least three years. Okay. I've been on immune suppressants for three years, um, but they're not keen to reduce any further and I'm on um, the three combined tacrolimus instead of cyclosporin, yeah. uh, spirulactin and azathioprine. So uh, now spironolactone as a, as a heart failure medication, but the, so it's azathioprine, tacrolimus and no prednisone? Uh, no, I haven't been on uh, prednisone for uh, a year. Right. And so 
so you know every I'm, uh, I don't know your situation personally, of course, and so I'm, I, I'm not giving you specific recommendations because I don't know enough to do that. But I would say um, there are people in my practice who I have kept on two agents for three years or more. Uh, but in people who have fully recovered heart function and are asymptomatic, and uh, again, I'm not saying that I'm sure that's the case with you, um, I have typically decreased to lower doses of, of a single agent. Um, but uh, there's a lot of nuance there, and so bef um, before I take that as advice, uh, you, you really would be best to, you know, consider, you know, it would take a complete review of all your records to know for sure if that's the right thing to say. Does and what agent, what agent do you keep your patients on? What single agent? Uh, well, it depends on side effects, really. Usually um, uh, it's a calcineurin inhibitor like the tacrolimus or cyclosporin. Here we yep. use cyclosporin, usually with a trough level of about 75 to 100. Uh, but that's... Um, there are a number of people who are intolerant of that, so for a variety yes. of reasons. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, you're very, you're very welcome. Mm -hmm. There are no further questions from the phone lines. Good. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everyone, and um, I see um, there in the chat room it says, um, are their improved drug therapy easier on the kidney? The short answer is um, in people who develop renal failure, acute renal failure um, or insufficiency on uh, cyclosporin, I have been uh, switching people to a different medicine, uh, rapamune or, or sirolimus, which is easier on the kidneys. I do not know whether that is um, equally effective. Um, but we've had good results if uh, out beyond uh, six months from initial symptom onset. We have another question from the phone lines. It's yes, hi. Um, I have a giant cell myocarditis. Yes. And my first episode was heart failure. And then two months later, um, my second episode was cardiac arrest. Um, I've been on immunosuppressants uh, since then for um, a little over two years. What is there any, um, I guess, data on uh, third events? <laughs> yeah. So, so in people who recur, um, I've ne I've never seen a fulminant recurrence while on at least uh, one immunosuppressant drug. So, in contrast to the acute or fulminant uh, heart failure, which is typical of the acute myocarditis, giant cell myocarditis presentation. The presentation uh, while on immunosuppression is much more subtle. It tends to be a, a, a very slow or um, chronic subacute process. The, um, that's the first thing. Uh, in those people who had arrhythmias, uh, like ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia as part of the presenting symptoms, I think Anecdotally, from my experience, they're more likely to have arrhythmias as part of their second recurrence if they recur. And those people who did not have arrhythmias but only had heart failure, I think it's, I've not appreciated a high rate of arrhythmias in those people who develop recurrence, but rather they just have heart failure. Uh, and again, both uh, tend to be a lot more subtle. Um, but um, that, that's, I think, the best way to answer your question. Uh, there are no published data. Okay. Uh, that's, that's all. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. There are no further questions from the phone lines at this time. Okay. Well, I just again thank everybody for uh, uh, attending uh, and calling in, and I hope uh, this is helpful for you, and, and I hope the foundation is, is helpful, really. Um, that's what it's there for, is to, to get the most accurate information out to people who need it, uh, both patients and physicians. So um, I guess with that, James and Brianna will we'll wrap it up.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines. Thank you.